welcome everybody, as I said, to the second uh, in our series of seminars on the uh, public law working uh, group uh, recommendations and changes. Uh, a fortnight ago, uh, I looked at pre proceedings and the new case management provisions and template orders. Uh, that seminar is available to, I think, all of you uh, and generally. And I would recommend that uh, if you haven't seen it, you do have a look through uh, because there are some very significant changes which are in the process of being implemented you know, as to how we undertake public law work. Uh, the umbrella uh, for uh, these changes is, of course, the uh, President's Public Law Working Group, chaired by Mr. Justice Kean. Uh, and uh, the slides that you have are, with the exception of the special guardianship slides, um, the approved slides uh, from the working group themselves. Uh, the special guardianship slides are slightly different uh, in that uh, they are the FLBA approved slides uh, that I've amended slightly this morning, um, but otherwise uh, are the approved version. Um, the President of the Family Division welcomed uh, the report in March of 2021, uh, and he said that the report is the fruit of intense and extensive collaborative work uh, by professionals uh, from all of the sectors working in child protection cases in the family justice system. Um, he importantly, he emphasized that the group had been formed, in fact, prior to the COVID pandemic, to investigate the steep rise in public law cases coming to the family court and to offer recommendations for improving the system's ability to address the needs of the children and families at the center of these important cases. He, he said that the additional pressures on the child protection and family justice systems arising from COVID uh, have only gone to underline the need for new ways of working uh, that the public or working group's recommendations prescribe. Uh, and it's an important feature as we go through, in particular, uh, what I spoke about a fortnight ago, uh, the renewed emphasis on pre-proceedings as a method of diverting cases away from the um, public law care system. And again, with section 20, uh, there is a renewed emphasis on using section 20 and section 76 in Wales to ensure that only those cases where it is necessary for proceedings to be issued uh, are, are taken through uh, the public law system in case of the diverted off where appropriate to other systems. Uh, he said that the, it's been a striking feature of the work, that it's been collaborative uh, and uh, the basis of agreement across the board rather than controversy. Um, he said that that indicates that the recommendations made are both sound and necessary. And as I say, we are in the process this month of a rolling implementation of these, um, of these changes. Um, the last matter by way of general introduction uh, I wanted to say is that uh, we run a series of talks on this through the FLBA. And one of the questions that came back from Mr. Justice Keane was whether the guidance is soft guidance, in, in other words, a recommendation, or hard guidance, in other words, to be followed in most, if not all, cases. Uh, the clear answer that we had back was that it is hard guidance and therefore the expectation is that the recommendations of the group will now be followed. Right, so we're going to start looking at section 20 and section 76 accommodation. I have the chat box open. It's really weird that I can't see you um, and we can't interact in a normal way. But please do put any questions that you have in the chat and hopefully I'll pick them up either as I go along or, or at the end of this seminar. Uh, we will finish come what may uh, at 1.30 um, so that you can all uh, go off to two o'clock hearings or, or to do other work. 
Um, right, so section 20. Uh, again, the starting point for the working group was the decline in the use of section 20 following the various cases, um, including the case of uh, the UN. And there now appeared to be a lack of clarity by social workers as to when section 20 could properly be used and a fear of criticism either by senior managers or by the judiciary. And certainly we'll all know uh, that uh, the use of section 20 or the abuse of section 20 has been subject to very serious judicial criticism in a number of different cases. And indeed, uh, in previous years, we've used as the basis for Human Rights Act claims, uh, declarations and damages awards. This corresponded with a with national data which demonstrated a fall in the number of children looked after under Section 20 and consequently an increase in the number of children who are looked after under care orders. So the proportion of all looked after children under a care order increased from 58% to 73%. Uh, and whilst the proportion of children accommodated under Section 20 fell correspondingly from 27% to 19%. Uh, there was a perception of inconsistency in the use of Section 20 and, and inconsistent guidance from the courts. And the feeling, therefore, that children and families were missing out on this important provision or it was being misused and otherwise it may lead to more favorable outcomes for children, for children and their families. In other words, outcomes which do not require the initiation of court proceedings. So we're going to look at the English statute, the Welsh statute, uh, and the general provisions and some key cases. You'll all be familiar uh, with section 20. Uh, the mandatory requirement of a, on a local authority to provide accommodation for a child where there are no persons with parental responsibility, the child is lost or abandoned, uh, and this is normally the key provision, where the person caring for the child is prevented from providing suitable accommodation for the child, uh, and uh, alternatively where the child is 16 years old and where that child's welfare is likely to be seriously prejudiced if they do not provide the child with accommodation. Uh, there's also a discretionary ability to provide accommodation for the child where necessary to safeguard and promote the child's welfare or where the person is 16 but under 21, they may be accommodated in a community home. Importantly, the local authority cannot accommodate a child if a person with parental responsibility who is willing and able to provide or arrange accommodation for the child object. Important to emphasize that it's not the provision or arrangement of suitable accommodation, it's the provision or arrangement of any accommodation. So where there is in essence an objection and when that person is able to provide or arrange for accommodation, then the local authority has no power to use section 20. Moreover, uh, that person with parental responsibility may at any time remove the child from local authority accommodation. Um, there's no requirement for a notice period uh, and subject to the following exceptions, uh, the person with a child arrangement lives with order or a special guardianship order or somebody looking after a child pursuant to the High Court's inherent jurisdiction has an overriding ability to consent. So, for example, if a mother has a literal order and consents under Section 20, a father who has a contact order cannot override that consent. Uh, and the other exception is that a child who is 16 or older, or older has their own ability to consent to accommodation. Uh, there's no statutory time limit. The accommodation can, and in my experience, sometimes will go on indefinitely, a uh, matter of months, sometimes even years. 
there is an equivalent provision in Wales uh, under Section 76 of the Social Service and Wellbeing Wales Act 2014. So the provisions are uh, very similar. Important to emphasize, as I think I have, that the local authority cannot stop somebody with parental responsibility removing the child from local authority accommodation. To stop that person removing the child requires a court order, such as an emergency protection order or a interim care order. Uh, or alternatively, the police can intervene and put the child temporarily uh, under child protection. The agreement to Section 20 or Section 76 accommodation operates as a delegation of day-to-day -day exercise of parental responsibility to the local authority, but it does not, as a interim care order does, or indeed a full care order, uh, give the local authority parental responsibility. Well, in a number of cases, the use or abuse of Section 20 uh, has been heavily criticised. Uh, so in the case of GM Nottingham, uh, the former president said that the law is perfectly clear, but perhaps it requires re-emphasis. Whatever the impression a casual reader may gain, no local authority and no social worker has any power to remove a child from its parent or without the agreement of the parent to take a child into care unless they have first obtained an order from a family court authorising that step. In 2012, Mr Justice Hedgeley, as he then was, uh, gave a, a very clear and helpful judgment in the case of Coventry City Council and CBCA and CH, uh, where he looked at the use of Section 20 uh, in a case uh, where the uh, mother um, may not have had capacity for consent. He said that the use of Section 20 must not be compulsion in disguise. The parent needs to have the requisite capacity to give their agreement, and it's essential that any consent is properly informed and fairly obtained. In the case of N, uh, it was said, again, that a local authority cannot use its powers under Section 20 if a parent objects. So where the child's parent is known and in contact with the local authority, the local authority requires the consent of that parent. And if the local authority fails to permit the parent to remove the child, um, then the local authority may act unlawfully, expose itself to civil proceedings, and indeed may even be guilty of a criminal offence. Uh, the most authoritative guidance was given by the Supreme Court in the case of Williams in London Borough of Hackney. Uh, and essentially there, uh, the uh, existing case law and good practice uh, was identified and emphasized. So as I've said, there it was, uh, and still is, a pattern by which section 20 has become used less and less often, and there are concerns by local authorities uh, that um, to use Section 20 may expose them to criticism. This was all addressed within the Public Law Working Group report, who have now provided a guide to good practice, an explanatory note for older children, and a template agreement. Uh, quite often, we used to find uh, that Section 20 agreements uh, were literally written on the back of an envelope or, or indeed not written at all. Uh, and uh, all that was sought was the verbal consent of, of a parent. Uh, that should happen no longer. The working group said that Section 20 agreements are versatile, agile and essential provisions that allow local authorities to provide appropriate support for children and their families. And with this in mind, the local authorities need to make sure that their social workers 
comply with the guide. The use of Section 20 should be monitored by senior managers. Each family must be assessed on the basis of their individual needs and circumstances. Uh, working in partnership with the family is an essential part of Section 20, or, or as I say in Wales, Section 76, and that in each case, uh, the steps that are set out in the guide to good practice uh, should be followed. So why is it that Section 20 is being considered in a particular case? Is the issue short term for assessment or perhaps respite, or is it to address longer term issues? Uh, the working group suggested that local authorities consider children in the appropriate age categories. So starting with newborn and young babies, and then toddlers up to five uh, years, ages six to preteens, teens to 16, and then 16 plus. The voice of the child needs to be identified, considered, and noted, and that separation of a newborn child from the parent under these provisions is rarely appropriate. Uh, one of the matters that local authorities have been told by the working group it is to make sure that there is proper planning for newborn children uh, and that removal um, where it is necessary should really only happen by way of court sanction. It's important to bear in mind the immigration status uh, of the uh, child concern. Very often section 20 is used to accommodate unaccompanied minors, for example, which raises a whole host of other issues, for example, uh, age assessments, uh, but also the need to have very clear immigration advice. So where there is an immigration issue, make sure the working group says that it is addressed as soon as possible. Children may have a different immigration status to their parents, uh, and that immigration and cultural issues are different considerations but may be connected. Identify who holds parental responsibility. The local authority should identify them, locate them, and consult them. Make sure the person, uh, the parent, has capacity to consent. If, if doubt, if in doubt, take steps to ensure that capacity is assessed. If the person has capacity but additional needs, ensure those needs are met and supported, for example, by way of referral to adult services, an independent advocacy agency, or an intermediary. Timing is crucial. Plan ahead and give the family as much time as possible to consider the option of section 20. Uh, with expecting parents, the process must begin before the birth of the child. Take very special care, as I've said, with expecting mothers or those who have recently given birth. They may require additional support, and as I've said, Section 20 may not be appropriate at all. And make sure that those consulted are given all the relevant information uh, in uh, a um, format that is accessible to them. Make sure that the relevant PR holder understands the consequences of giving consent and that they're able to withdraw their consent at any time. There must be no duress or threat, whether disguised or otherwise, to issue court proceedings. How often in the past did we see it recorded that a social worker spoke to the parent and said that unless they gave their consent under section 20, the matter would need to be referred for the initiation of legal proceedings. That is duress and a threat and not a permissible way of securing a Section 20 agreement. Consent is a positive act. Silence, a lack of objection or acquiescence is not consent. Consent must be given prior to or at the time of accommodation. It cannot be provided retrospectively. Where possible, those holding parental responsibility should have access to legal advice, although, of course, there are public funding difficulties there. 
and agree the purpose and duration of the accommodation with the parent in advance, or at least as soon as possible. This can be amended during review. As I've said, there's a template agreement, a useful template agreement, which really should now be used and is designed to maximize compliance with the practice guide. It can also, of course, be important evidence in any future proceeding. There needs to be regular review. As I've said, agree the frequency in advance, but that may change. Uh, it, the accommodation must be reviewed as soon as practical following any change in the circumstances of the child or the family. Be clear, local authority must be clear to those agreeing to accommodation that they can ask for a review at any time. The review should be shared by an IRO and during the period of accommodation, the needs of the child must be regularly reviewed and provided for. Those with parental responsibility retain that parental responsibility during the period of accommodation. So as I've said, a person who consents delegates the exercise of his or her parental responsibility for day-to-day -day tasks, but no more than that, and must be kept informed about his or her child. Local authority cannot interfere with the parental responsibility holders' exercise of their own parental responsibility, even if they disagree with the decisions being made. And if consent is withdrawn, the child must be returned immediately, as I've said, subject, of course, to any court order or police action. So the sort of situations where sections 20 and section 76 may appropriately be used are for respite care, so where the child has a medical condition or disability or presents with challenging behaviour, or there is an unexpected family or domestic crisis. It may be appropriate whether carers require a short period to undertake an assessment, participate in therapy, or for example, undergo detoxification. The carers may require a short time to improve their own home condition. The carers uh, or some other dependent may require some medical treatment and recovery time. Uh, there may be provision of education under Section 20, such as at a residential school. And as I've already referred to, uh, an unaccompanied minor uh, coming into the jurisdiction um, may well require Section 20 accommodation. There is an explanatory note on the use of Section 20 for older children. Uh, this is intended to assist them to understand better what it means to be accommodated and to raise appropriate questions. And there is in the final appendix some documentation um, that can assist I think, practitioners, but also a lot of it is to assist parents uh, and children in understanding the processes that they are going through. Right. Um, as I've said, there is a template agreement. Um, it is permissible for local authorities to adopt a variation if they have a better version. It's clear um, so that it sets out what's being agreed to and by whom. It can be amended in each review and will be a working document for families and PR holders. And as I've said, it may be an important piece of evidence and the use of it is strongly recommended. Right, I'm just going to check uh, whether there are any questions um, in the chat. I don't think I saw any. But if anybody wishes to put in any questions, uh, please do so. And I happily will come back to section 20 um, if asked to do so. There was one other thing I was going to say, um, which was a very good question we were asked and referred to Mr. Justice Kean, um, which uh, involved uh, the um, use of Section 20 um, 
the use of Section 20 in the middle care proceedings. It was quite often said that um, an interim care order was not necessary because the parents would agree in the course of proceedings to Section 20 accommodation. Um, and we were asked whether the working group had any views on that. Uh, having referred it to just him, the answer is that it is unlikely to be an appropriate use of Section 20. Uh, the perceived disadvantages of the making of an interim orders are perhaps more in the minds of the parents than justified by the provision. Yes, of course, a parent may feel uh, that by agreeing to Section 20, they are avoiding the imposition of what might be seen as a more draconian court order. But in reality, um, interim care orders bring with it a whole host of advantages, not just to the child in, in enabling local authority to share parental responsibility, but also to a parent, for example, in imposing an obligation on local authority to provide reasonable contact. Um, so it is not felt that Section 20 will very often be used as a substitute for the middle of the proceedings. Um, I see a question from Eleanor Hinton um, asking whether it's ever appropriate to place with a family member under Section 20, and if so, what are the benefits of this over a family arrangement? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I don't see anything in the report that changes the existing practice. Uh, which is that Section 20 will often be used uh, as a vehicle to uh, place with family members. Um, the advantages of a family over a family arrangement uh, will be that the child will be looked after, uh, and therefore the uh, family member may well be entitled to local authority support, including financial support. Um, so it, it, it is, I, Ordinarily, and I've done many cases where uh, this has been a feature um, in the administrative court, uh, where the, the family members are seeking to be funded as foster carers uh, for providing Section 20 accommodation. There's quite a lot of case law on, on the question of whether it really is a family arrangement or whether this is something that's been orchestrated by the local authority. I don't see anything that changes in those authorities. And so I think, Eleanor, the answer to the question is, yes, it can be appropriate to a place for a family member, and the benefits will be local authority support of that uh, placement, including possibly financial support. Um, right, um, so let's carry on um, and look at special guardianship. Got on one o'clock, so we're in exactly on time. Um, As I say, these are not, these are, oh, you can see the FLBA slides, um, but, uh, and they cover the matter. Oh, I've got a message. And they cover the issues um, that arose in relation to the publication of the interim report um, and also. Um, let me just check. I'm told, sorry, there's a question in the Q&A, but I'll need to come out of the slides for a second. So, message from Joe uh, Levy. Local authorities are criticised for removing newborns at urgent hearings with short notice. Very difficult to get the balance right between getting into court straight away knowing a mother would be in vulgar state having just given birth and trying to plan with section 20, which you've highlighted is felt to be scarcely appropriate. Alongside this, the social worker is having to navigate through difficult conversations with maternity units who often want the child and mother out as soon as possible. It feels like we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. I understand the guidance of you people coming on the very complex and sensitive area of pre-birth work. Any ideas when this may be available? Well, I can answer the last question first. The, the, the pre proceedings guidance is available uh, and is available on, on the uh, website and, and form part of what we looked at uh, a fortnight ago. Um, the expectation is that it, where removal um, is likely to be sought, 
after the birth, uh, then various steps can be taken in, in pre proceedings, which would include, of course, the provision of legal advice, uh, but also the provision of draft documents. So the social work statement should be provided to the solicitor for the expecting parents uh, in advance of the birth. Um, I think the question probably uh, about proceedings is whether there is sufficient justification for seeking removal. Um, yes, it may well be said that uh, a parent is in a very vulnerable position having just given birth um, and the local authority are the next day seeking an EPO or an interim care order. Um, but the question is, what's the alternative? And I'm not sure there is anything. I think seeking a Section 20 agreement will, uh, as the question highlights, scarcely be appropriate. Uh, and where removal is necessary, it is necessary. Uh, and um, the uh, direction of travel that I think is least likely to lead to criticism is bringing the matter urgently before the court. After all, the court can adjourn or, or refuse the application. Uh, and in those circumstances, the court has taken ownership of the decision. But I think delaying issue proceedings or seeking to manage it under Section 20 uh, will rarely be the answer to that problem. I think it's about pre-birth planning, pre-birth discussion, draft documents in advance. Right, so let's come back then oh, to special guardianship. Um, you can see from the background that uh, special guardianship orders were introduced in 2002. Uh, the aims uh, were set out in government white paper, um, very much seen uh, as a bridging option between, on the one hand, a child arrangements order, uh, which means that essentially all, all of those with parental responsibility retain that parental responsibility, uh, and an adoption order, which of course effect legally removes a parent's parental responsibility. Uh, often thought to be most appropriate for family placements, but sometimes other carers, for example, foster carers uh, may seek a special guardianship order. It, it gives the carer an enhanced uh, parental responsibility, effectively a casting vote uh, on various issues, various important issues, uh, and the ability to uh, restrain any application to change where the child lives. Uh, except with the permission of the court. There were developing concerns and still are. The first arose from the 26 week statutory timetable, which could lead to insufficient, uh, robust assessments or, or else excluding potential kinship carers because they emerged too late in the process. 26 weeks was very much seen as a straitjacket uh, and not necessarily operating uh, in child's best interest. I inevitably trying to resolve these issues in 26 weeks would mean that insufficient time would be allowed to see how the relationship between the child and potential and special guardian uh, developed. And this could lead to final orders being made in favor of carers with no established relationship with the child. We've all seen, and they are worrying, and indeed uh, have led to some quite high profile tragedy. Uh, what was then really considered was the question of whether special guardianship orders had become, in essence, yeah. risky placement. Uh, there was a review in 2015, and, and that review singled out in particular a special guardianship um, the use of supervision orders alongside special guardianship orders as a possible indicator of a risky placement where there were doubts about the capacity of the carers to look after the child in the longer term. So what was tending to happen uh, was the drive to complete cases within 26 weeks was leading to the court making a final order sooner than it otherwise would and seeking the reassurance of attaching a supervision order to keep the local authority involved. The uh, regulations um, were amended in 2016 to try to beef up the scope 
of the local authority assessment and, and identified issues such as harm suffered, risk of harm, the nature of the prospective special guardian's current and past relationship with the child, and a more detailed analysis of their parenting capacity. But I think the general consensus with the 2016 reforms didn't actually achieve the outcomes that they saw. And so concerns remain. Uh, the leading case um, on looking at special guardianship orders was and remains the case of RePS. And that was a case where the judge of first instance had bolstered um, the special guardianship placement by essentially making a full care order, but specifying that the care order was to be of a short duration. Uh, the Court of Appeal overturned the decision on the basis that this concept of a short-term care order as a way of testing out a potential special guardianship placement was flawed. And the Court of Appeal commented specifically on this tension between the 26 week time limit and the time needed to complete the more complex welfare determination, particularly as potential special guardians often come to the fore uh, at a late, later stage of proceeding, uh, either because they haven't properly been identified earlier, or perhaps because they've been reluctant to come forward earlier where the parents were themselves contesting uh, the need for placement away from them. Um, the Court of Appeal also commented, and I find this is important in practice, that the judge had been wrong not to make uh, appropriate provision for grandparents in that case to obtain effective access to justice at the, at the hearing, for example, by making them as a party, by making the party. The grandparents had essentially been left without documents uh, or advice. And I've often heard it said that the grandparents or other carers are literally sitting outside of court, knowing that they are being discussed, but without having access to the hearing. Uh, the Court of Appeal pointed to the need for authoritative guidance, but we've now got that. And if the process cannot be completed just and fairly um, within 26 weeks, uh, then the time must be extended. I just draw your attention to the latest research, March 2019, which identifies, I think, quite usefully what was happening. Uh, they've identified, the national study identified that special guardianship, there's been a marked rise in the use of special guardianship orders as an outcome for Section 31 proceedings. In fact, only 1% of the children made subject to special guardianship orders had an application for this order in the Section 31 proceeding. The majority of orders have been made by the court acting on its own motion rather than upon application. Um, just pausing there, it is an easy answer to uh, the need for party status for the special guardians to be encouraged to make their own application because no one can question their status if they put a live application before the court. Um, it was said that children on standalone special guardianship orders have a 5% probability of new care proceedings within five years, and that uh, adding a supervision order increased that probability to 7%. You may think actually not a particularly high failure rate, although the special guardianship order may have come to an end in a different way. Um, nonetheless, um, one in 20 uh, requiring new care proceedings uh, may not be as bad uh, as, as one might have thought. Um, samples uh, of the orders made were considered 107 children placed with 77 families. Um, this the statistic I find really most surprising. 31% of the children subject to the order had not lived with the special guardian, prospective special guardian to test out, sorry, to test out the suitability of the placement before the order was made. That's a very high percentage, one in three. Special guardianship placements were very positive. Um, 
Uh, and where ongoing difficulties were reported, these were largely housing and financial pressures and then tensions between the special guardians and the birth parents uh, regarding contact. The consistent message from professionals was that in many ways, special guardians have a tougher task than adopted. They have to manage the contact with birth parents. Adoptive parents very rarely do. Adopters receive preparation, a lengthier assessment, and more information on the child. And that uh, special guardians interviewed were consistently negative about the local authority assessment of court process, particularly when they don't have their own legal advice. In cases where the supervision order was made, actually special guardians found they were more supportive of contact, particularly during the first years. In contrast, where there wasn't a supervision order, the special guardians felt abandoned by the local authority post proceeding, and there was a lack of communication and insufficient support. So the uh, report from Lancaster University concluded that special guardianship remains a valuable option, they're generally low risk and have high sustainability. And there may not be any obvious benefits for attaching a supervision order to a special guardianship order, but outcomes may have been worse without. Uh, the views of the special guardians painted a troubling picture. Um, they found that supervision orders generally supportive, 26 week time frame can be a problem, timely legal advice is very important. And as I've said, a third of the children were not living with their guardians uh, when the order was made, and that's consistent with other research. I just want to flag up um, a video uh, in case you're interested. The first day of forever, it's available um, on, on YouTube. Um, it's uh, prepared by Judith Harwin, and it just shows the accounts given by special guardians. And I've just flagged up a few points that they've raised in, in the course of the interviews. Um, a lack of understanding of the process to sisters who were involved in, in um, taking on the special guardians, taking on children on special guardianship, Googling their way through the process. Um, that actually for, particularly for older carers, they're giving up their hard earned freedom to be available for these children, perhaps not recognized uh, necessarily um, by the professionals assessing them by the courts. That they feel cut out from the process. They feel that terminology in courts baffling and terrifying. They lack the legal advice. They're excluded from the courtroom. I've mentioned this, even though the discussion's about them. Lack of detail in the support plan. Now that's very important. Often the support plan um, can be full of good intention, but nothing specific as to how those intentions are reacting. Uh, there may be difficulties with family contact lack of training and information, a lack of public recognition or understanding of special guardianship, going to the school and saying, um, well, we're the special guardians and, and getting the response back, yes, but we need to contact the parents. Um, sloppy paperwork, documents that are clearly cut and pasted from other documents, and a lack of clarity as to what financial support they're entitled to. So, Coming on then to the public law working group recommendations, these were made separate from the main report back in June 2020. Uh, the public law working group said there was little evidence to suggest that the amendments to the regulations have made any difference to the matters as set considered in the assessments or by the court. A special guardianship assessment needs substantial time and resources. And only in exceptional circumstances should a court exercise its power to make the order of its own motion. If it's considering this option, then the report prepared by the local authority must be fully compliant with the schedule and primary legislation and fully evidence-based, and that follows the existing authorities. Just because the court is making the order of its own motion doesn't mean the assessment process is any less stringent. Uh, the, there were some recommendations about the make, place interim placement pending making the final order. It was said that the clearest option is to place the child with the carers uh, as approved connected parent persons, uh, foster carers. 
Um, an interim care order could be the solution, uh, and that wouldn't complete the care proceeding. There's a danger in making a child arrangements order as a placement option, because this excludes the family from the mandatory assessment of need, as the child would not have been in care immediately before the order was made. There's no power to make an interim special guardianship order, as we know, and that extending the use of placement orders would need exploration in the primary legislation. This was an idea that um, much as with adoption proceedings, you could have a interim stage where the court makes a placement order uh, relevant to the special guardianship that does not confirm the making of the order itself, but that would require uh, a whole new round of primary legislation. The uh, working group said that making the supervision order would be a red flag um, and, and would often indicate uh, that there was a problem uh, where the assessment and support plan was not being sufficiently clear, thorough or robust to give confidence that the placement's in the best world of interest of the child or that the support plan will meet the needs of the proposed placement. So cases where it's appropriate or necessary to make a supervision order mm -hmm. alongside the super special guardianship order are likely in our view to be very small in number. They recommended that the assessment and support plan should be robust and comprehensive and compliant with the regulations and the timings for the provision of such assessments should be realistic to provide for this. Uh, it, it's no longer acceptable for a local authority to say to the court that we need 12 or 14 weeks to complete the assessment uh, and to be told by the court, well, you can have six. That does not enable a sufficiently robust and comprehensive assessment to be prepared. And it's not just a question of local authority time and resources, it's also a question of seeing how the assessment develops over time. In other words, giving the prospective carers plenty of opportunity to reflect upon the assessment process. To ensure there's proper assessment, um, the there needs to be adequate attention paid to and time taken to build relationships and develop and observe contact between the child and the proposed guardian. Uh, and where that relationship building work has not formed part of the assessment process, it's likely further time will be needed to allow the work to be carried out before proceedings are concluded. Where there is little or no prior connection or relationship between the child and the prospective guardian, um, then it's very likely to be in the child's best interest that the child is cared for on an interim basis by the prospective special guardian, um, for example, under an ICO, before any final consideration yeah. is given to the making of the order. Uh, and where a party proposes the court should make a special guardianship order, consideration should be given at an early stage to the issue of joining the proposed special guardian as a party to the proceedings. And if joined, consideration should be given for funding of legal representation for the proposed guardian. Now, I'll come back to the issue of funding. Of course, uh, the legal aid agency will make its own decision as to whether the special guardian, proposed special guardian, should be funded. It is quite often the case that local authorities will offer at least a limited opportunity for the guardian to have some legal advice, perhaps two or three hours um, of, of work, and at least that's something. There should be better preparation and training for special guardians, um, for example, looking at the work undertaken with prospective adopters. There should be, as I've said, a reduction in supervision orders uh, with special guardianship orders. Um, this should not be seen as a vehicle by which support and services are provided by the local authority, for example, in the supportive contact. These are matters that should be set out within the special guardianship support plan, which should be attached as an appendix to the order making the uh, special guardianship order. And there should be what's termed a renewed emphasis on parental contact. This needs to be given careful consideration. What is the purpose of 
contact? What are the factors relevant to determine the form of contact and its frequency? What professional input will be required to support the carers in facilitating contact? And what planning and support is required to ensure the stability of the placement in the context of ongoing contact? Special guardians should not be allowed simply or left to simply have to manage this on its, on its own. It's just not fair to ask them to do so. We now have the uh, best practice guidance issued in March 2021. That forms the basis of uh, what I think was Appendix E to the original report. It is, as I can see it, it's unchanged from uh, what was in the 2020 uh, report. Uh, but it now has the approval of the president and therefore comes into place as the best practice guidance. Uh, where care proceedings have been issued and family members identified as potential carers, the local authority should undertake an initial assessment, a viability assessment. It's important that the realistic options for the child are fairly evaluated and a cap is not placed on the number of potential carers by way of case management direction. The emphasis should nonetheless be on realistic options and proposals for assessment will be evaluated on that basis. Now, can I say that the um, cap that sometimes one sees uh, can work in, in, in rather unexpected ways. Uh, I, I was once involved in a case um, where a cap had been placed on, on prospective carers uh, by the case management judge doing her best, I know, to try and limit the work to be undertaken by the local authority. By the time of the final hearing, it was plain that the, the father in that case, uh, having identified two potential options, one being his own father and another being a connected person, and having identified his father uh, as the person he wanted to be assessed. Um, it was plain at final hearing that, in fact, the, the, the grandfather was not a viable alternative carer, but uh, the connected person was. The father was asked why, given the obvious um, conclusion to the assessment process, which was his father was not an appropriate carer, why he hadn't identified the connected person. And the answer he gave is, well, when I had to choose, I was aware of my father's view that if I didn't nominate him, he would hit me. And so that was the basis upon which he'd nominated his own father as the carer. Um, it's not fair or right to expect parents to choose between viable returns of carers if there are two viable carers, both of them need to be assessed. And where there's a positive initial assessment, there needs to be a plan to set out the next steps to include identifying the legal options for securing the placement, identifying the key factors that need to be addressed and ensuring the child's needs and circumstances are fully understood and addressed in the interim arrangements, ensuring the carer is fully aware of the child's needs and fully supported to meet those needs, ensuring necessary checks and references are completed, including any safeguarding issues, and answering the question how the family members are to participate in the proceedings, including party status and access to independent legal advice. Where proceedings are commenced, all parties, including the children's guardian, should file and serve position statements in advance of the first case management hearing to include outline details of proposed carers for assessment by the local authority. Proposed special guardians must be clearly identified in the social work evidence template by reference to a genogram or other materials. The children guardians initial analysis, while it will now be a position statement, um, initial analyses have gone, uh, should expressly address the identification of carers and their contact details, and the sharing of details of prospective special guardians must not be determined by the approval or disapproval of the parents. Uh, as is made clear in the guidance published by the Family Justice Council, the system, and that's Annex, uh, Annex A to the uh, March 2021 best practice guidance. The system should not be driven by the statutory duty to complete proceedings in 26 weeks, and therefore the judge should approve an extension beyond 26 weeks 
to allow for proper assessment and in, just as importantly, the development of the relationship between the child and prospective special guardian. The focus will always be on welfare and the fundamental requirement for robust evidence-based assessment. Uh, where care proceedings are authorised beyond 26 weeks, the case will need to be removed from the CMS 26 week track and entered into a separate database. I think there was some perception uh, that different court centres were competing against each other in, in order to uh, ensure that they had the best statistics of cases completed within 26 weeks. Uh, that may not be a child centred approach, and so uh, the guidance is for steps to be taken to counter that. Uh, where an interim plan for placement with the proposed special guardian is endorsed by the court, a timetable will need to be prepared to enable the proceedings to be concluded and for any outstanding issues to be resolved before the final order is made. Uh, this is important. It's anticipated the timetable will be no more than 12 months from interim placement. Uh, I think that's important because it is actually signposting that 12 months is okay. If it's going to take 12 months, it's going to take 12 months. But obviously, if it's shorter, that's so much the better. Um, but there isn't a requirement that it be uh, finalised within a matter of weeks or even one or two months uh, post placement. Where it becomes apparent to the local authority there's sufficient evidence then to reach an evidence based conclusion uh, that the uh, placement cannot succeed, um, they should bring the matter back to court. Sorry, the slides cut off there. Uh, but that should say they should bring the matter back to court sooner if it becomes clear essentially the placement will fail. Um, there's an Annex B to the guidance, and that sets out the options for placement for family and friends. Um, I've set those out for you. Uh, approval as foster carers uh, under an interim care order. I think that's always going to be the easiest route. It says or a care order, but you'll bear in mind what's said in the EPS. Um, secondly, a placement director's assessment under section 38.6. I think that's a very viable option sometimes. Care proceedings continue, um, but this is a, a residential assessment under section 38.6. Um, third, there could be approval, temporary approval under regulation 24. There could be placement under regulation 27, but that's only really likely to apply for older children because it requires consent. Uh, there could, of course, be a making a special guardianship order where there is an established relationship, or, or it could be under a child arrangements order, but we've already looked at the disadvantages there are to such a placement, uh, potentially in relation to the support services that are being offered post the making of the special guardianship order, because the child will not have been in care immediately prior, prior to the making of the order, and, for example, the um, special guardians will not in those circumstances have access to the adoption support fund uh, that they would otherwise have access to. The supervision order should not be used as the vehicle for support and services, but I've already said that. Um, special guardians can be considered, special guardianship can be considered for placement of the child outside of the jurisdiction. Now that raises a whole host of issues beyond the scope of this talk. Um, importantly, looking at just how the assessment will be carried out in a legally compliant and culturally relevant matter. Um, thought should be given as to what the status of special guardians within that country would be, how the support services would be provided, and what the contingency arrangements are. Always need to bear in mind that assessments in foreign jurisdictions will often require them to be conducted by somebody authorised within that jurisdiction to carry out such an assessment. Um, social work in many places a regulated profession, and so the person assessing a family member abroad may need to have authorisation and qualifications within that jurisdiction. That's an important point often missed in, in those difficult cases. And lastly, the uh, working group made some longer term recommendations. Um, there should be an ongoing review of the statutory framework. Um, for example, whether the option for local authorities to place with special guardians under a care order may in fact be an appropriate development. Recommendation two, there needs to be further analysis and inquiry 
whether the fostering regulations require review and revision, uh, whether the Children Act should be amended to provide the court with the power to make an interim special guardianship order, um, and whether to impose further duty on local authorities to explore whether there are potential carers who could be appointed as special guardian for the child. Recommendation three, there should be a review of public funding for proposed special guardians. Well, don't hold your breath. Um, and recommendation four, there should be uh, perhaps greater use of the family group competences as a way of identifying realistic options for the child. Right, that brings us to the end. I can see we're just over um, half past. Let me just check the chat and the questions. Um, are there any questions? Um, chat now or put something in the Q and A box. I can't see anything, but Sean will let me know if I'm missing anything. If there are no questions, um, then thank you very much for attending. Do catch up uh, if you can uh, with session one, if you missed it. Um, uh, and please do come separately if you've got any questions or need any uh, help, including help uh, with training uh, at the at Palm Court Chambers and also uh, through the FLBA. We're, we're happy to try and uh, make sure that we can provide as much training to those within the profession as we can. So thank you very much indeed, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you.